For me, there is no bigger story in the history of MLS than the Save the Crew movement. It was the classic tale about the people, the little guys, taking on the establishment. A story about a fan base that refused to lay down and see their team leave. <whistles> Tuesday, October 16th, 2017. This Grant Wall tweet and story on Sports Illustrated was the start of it all. I remember thinking, oh yeah, right. Like, there's no way MLS is going to allow this to happen. I mean, this is the first MLS club. What kind of precedent would that send if they just allowed an owner to just pick up and move? I mean, one of the stars on the MLS logo literally stands for community. For club, for country, for community. I mean, come on, MLS. You might as well just Photoshop that star out of your logo if you are seriously okay with uprooting one of the clubs just because the owner wants to. Okay, now I hear what you're saying. But wait, what about the Dynamo? Yeah, remember, after the 05 season, the San Jose Earthquakes picked up and moved to Houston. Now, listen, I feel for the fans of San Jose, especially because the new Earthquakes haven't exactly reached the levels of the old Earthquakes. But it was under different circumstances. I mean, San Jose didn't even have their own stadium back then and they did ultimately get their team back in 08. I know, 06 and 07 must have been awful for them, but the plan was always to return to San Jose. But a lot has changed since the 10 years since the Quakes returned. Now everyone is vying for an MLS team. And if Columbus moves, MLS ain't coming back. Um, you said the way that you guys heard about it. How, how did you find out? Uh, by reading news accounts and other uh, uh, things, you know. So the crew has never uh, given you guys like a, a direct, we need X, Y, and Z if we're going to stay in Columbus. The, they ha it sounds to me like you're saying that they're, they haven't been as um, direct with, with what they're looking for. Am I characterizing that correctly? Or? I think that'd probably be a fair characterization. Okay. The fact that none of the city officials had any idea that this move was in the works before the Grant Wall tweet leads me to believe that Anthony Precourt had absolutely no intention of ever working with the city of Columbus to try to make this work. His mind was made up. He was moving to Austin. And so, the fans got to work. They met and decided real quickly that this was not the time for mourning. This was the time for fighting for what's theirs. And they were not going to let just some Californian with an obsession with the city of Austin steal the crew. The hashtag Save the Crew was started and it quickly gained steam. As fans from other teams started to show their support, even changing the colors of their team's badge to black and gold to match the crew. A rally was planned on Sunday following the announcement on Tuesday, which had to be moved to City Hall because of the amount of people that were showing up. That's pretty impressive, actually, considering they probably had to get a permit to hold the rally and getting the word out, rounding the troops. That's not an easy task. It's not the fact that a hashtag was started or that they held a rally. I mean, hashtags are started every day. It was the sheer number of people that showed up. This wasn't just a small group of guys who didn't have work that day. No, it seemed like the whole city was behind this movement, city officials included. And something that's underrated in all of this is how they showed up. These rallies could have very easily turned ugly fast. I can think of a few fan bases in this league where that could have happened. But it didn't here. Because the movement was always focused on keeping the crew in Columbus. And not on trying to kill Precourt or burn down MLS. The next move was bring Save the Crew to the national stage. And it just so happens that the timing lined up for the perfect opportunity. ESPN College Game Day, the pregame show for college football that is seen by millions of viewers every week. 
and it was heading to Columbus for Ohio State versus Penn State. The Save the Crew team met at campus at 4.30 a.m. to get into position. And when the cameras turned on, there they were. Gold and black Save the Crew banners in virtually every shot on TV. In fact, there was just about as much gold and black that day as there was scarlet and gray. For a lot of people, non-soccer fans and soccer fans alike, this was the first time they had heard of Save the Crew. And the number of times Save the Crew was Googled exploded. And now, it was more than just a hashtag. Just three days after their appearance on ESPN College Game Day, on Halloween night, the Columbus crew hosted NYCFC in the first leg of the Eastern Conference semifinals. The Save the Crew flags were flying and the stadium was packed. But oddly enough, the announced attendance was listed at just over 14,000. Now I've heard of fudging the attendance numbers to make it seem like more people were there than not there, but the opposite? That seems kind of weird. I mean, you will see games with half the amount of people in the lower bowls, and MLS will announce it at 15,000. This is a 20,000 seat stadium, which was nearly filled to the brim. No visible seats on TV. And yet they expect us to believe that only 14,000 attended? That's the first sign to me that something fishy was going on. Oh listen, I love MLS, it's my favorite league in the world, and I will defend it and Don Garber more than I probably should but I'm not gonna pretend like they can't do any wrong. It's an imperfect league, and I'm not gonna turn a blind eye. This whole situation with the Columbus crew and Austin was messed up. The Columbus crew spanked NYCFC four to one, with some help from Sean Johnson. The next home playoff game was the first leg of the Eastern Conference Finals against Toronto FC. The crew ultimately ended up falling short of MLS Cup in this series. But this was the game of their famous Respect Your Roots TIFO, which is still one of the best TIFOs in league history. No one knew how long this saga would last, and even if it was possible. But Save the Crew never folded. It's said that each weekend they'd meet up at a local brewery to calculate their next move. And it's not like there was any vacation time in any of this. It was pretty much nonstop, unpaid work beginning to end, even during the MLS offseason. And the amount of stuff they were able to accomplish was pretty amazing. But now, shortly after the start of the 2018 season, Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine stepped in and sued Precourt Sports Ventures and MLS over the Art Modell Law. What's the Art Modell Law? Well, for that, we have to go back to 1995. Cleveland Browns apparently set to skip town at the end of the year and move to Baltimore. We'll detail that for you in a moment. The Browns are indeed coming to Baltimore. In the middle of the 95 season, Cleveland Browns owner Art Modell shocked the NFL world by announcing the Cleveland Browns, one of the oldest and most storied franchises in the NFL, would be moving to Baltimore. Cleveland didn't handle it so well. Can't say I blame them. As a result, this led to a new law, Ohio Revised Code Section 9.67, better known as the Art Modell Law. It says owners whose teams use tax-supported facilities and accept financial assistance from the state are prohibited from moving to another city unless they give at least six months notice and give individuals who live in the area an opportunity to purchase the team. Now here's the thing. This is the first actual test of the Art Modell Law because nobody in Ohio has tried to move a team since the Browns. Precourt and MLS argued that it was unconstitutional because it blocks the ability for businesses to engage in commerce in other states. I think that reasoning is kind of bogus, but I am absolutely not a law expert. But even if the case didn't stand a real chance, it did, at the bare minimum, delay the process of moving. Because if you know anything about the court system in this country, it basically takes forever and a half to resolve anything. So pre-court and MLS couldn't move anything until this was settled. 
During the 2018 MLS season, the Columbus crew had the lowest attendance in the league, which admittedly was a bit deflating. On the one hand, I completely get it. It's like, why would you give one more penny to this owner who is trying to fuck over your city and your club? On the other hand, the low attendance numbers just gave more ammo to those in favor of the move. You heard a lot of things like, Oh, well, if the fans wanted the crew to stay in Columbus, they wouldn't be staying home. There were also stories of weird ticketing issues at the gate, which made the stadium look more empty at kickoff, and also stories of the bathrooms not being properly stocked. I can't confirm any of this because I wasn't there, but I can confirm this picture, which shows the condiment table wasn't properly stocked, so yeah. A lot of people think Save the Crew was just a hashtag and people whining on Twitter, and that is so far from the truth. Because while it was a collective effort from all of the crew fans, there was a dedicated group who worked day and night on this cause. And remember, like, they're not getting paid for this. This is basically volunteer work. They're doing all of this on top of their normal day jobs. So they covered the city in banners and billboards. They managed to get over 300 small and local businesses to help support the cause. Considering that one of the reasons to justify the move was that Precourt wasn't able to get any local businesses to sponsor the crew. The lie detector test determined that was a lie. But along with just gathering support, Save the Crew also did a ton for the community. They volunteered, they held free soccer clinics, they even purchased season tickets and distributed them to different community groups. It wasn't just about saving their favorite soccer team. It was also about proving a point that soccer can bring people together in the most beautiful way. Now, one of the most frustrating aspects about this whole saga was how quiet MLS was. MLSsoccer.com had no problem reporting on Austin FC and their stadium search, but were completely silent on this incredible grassroots movement. And don't tell me it's because it wasn't team-related. If MLS can report on a guy wearing a horse mask in New England, they could have said something about Save the Crew. But they didn't. Why? Because Save the Crew was a PR nightmare for MLS. The fact that the majority of supporters of every other team were showing their support for Columbus and were against the move was a bad look for MLS. And the fact that you started to see Save the Crew pop up in England and get support from others around the world was a bad look for MLS. The heat was turning up on Don Garber. And now I feel like he was starting to rethink if this was even worth it in the end. Oh, and don't forget about the community kit, the official jersey of Save the Crew, which was strategically priced cheaper than other MLS kits for sale. Other really creative MLS kits. I've always loved this hoop design. You know it's Columbus because of the colors, but the yellow and black hoops were so distinctive that you knew it was for Save the Crew. And the best part is, none of the money raised for that went to Precourt. They also had a badge, which I don't really understand the purpose of that, to be honest, but it did look nice. I found out while researching this that they actually lost money with these jerseys because the production cost was so high. But I still think those jerseys had a positive impact because it continued to raise awareness on the cause. Now, please, Columbus, can you actually make these jerseys for real? I mean, not only is it a sick design, but it would be the perfect tribute to Save the Crew. In August, Save the Crew also designed their own concept stadium. And not just the look of it, but like everything about it. The location, the amenities, the public transport, like they really went all out. Okay, so what's the point of this? Well, the point is to show that this was made by regular people. Precourt never even attempted something close to this ambitious in Columbus. And it shows that under the right leadership, you could make something incredible. But speaking of stadiums, Anthony Precourt was awfully busy in Austin, trying to secure his location at McCalla Place. Insert Leslie Poole. 
the devil in the eyes of Austin fans, and Jesus Christ in the eyes of Columbus fans. I have never once watched a live stream town hall meeting before, and I doubt I'll ever do it again. But I was glued to my computer screen on the edge of my seat. It was surreal watching this and having Twitter up on another tab. Because, I mean, a lot of it was political lingo. It was hard to understand, but then you had people clear it up online. And then the amount of people debating this and arguing about it. It's something that I had never experienced online in MLS. I knew this was one of the final hurdles. Like, if you get a stadium secured and you find a way to pay for it in a way that doesn't piss off every person, you're in. And it would have been a walk in the park, if not for Leslie Poole. Poole drilled PSV. As she stated later, it wasn't that she was opposed to a soccer team in Austin. She just hated the contract. She thought the tax money should be used in a better way. And she was also opposed to taking a team from another city. What Poole and the others who opposed the current deal wanted was four things. One, requiring PSV to pay rent at the market price, as in tax exempt. Two, require PSV to fully fund a new train station to and from the station. Yeah, that's probably going to cost more than what he had in mind for this project. Three, adding on to the train station, establish a solid transportation and traffic plan. And four, enforce heavy financial penalties if the team were to relocate again. Those penalties being he would have to return the land, reimburse the city for all remediation costs and rent, starting at $1.9 million and increasing by 2% each year following. Yeah, she wasn't playing around. Ultimately, Precourt Sports Ventures won the vote, 7-4, to four, in favor of building a stadium in McCalla Place. When Anthony Precourt went to shake Leslie Poole's hand, we got this interaction. Leslie, thank you. Sure, Anthony. Uh, you've been really very to the project. I hope that you are a good and faithful partner I to the city of Austin. I will be. In ways that you were not in Columbus. You are on, you're on the record now for promises that you must fulfill. I will fulfill them. Promise you that. I hope I hope everybody catches that. Anthony Precourt promises to fulfill his promises. That's great. <laughs> it's kind of funny. The way she's standing above him like a mother and making him promise to be a good boy this time. I mean, you could tell that she just doesn't really like this guy. Now, if I'm going to be honest, I thought it was over. I thought MLS was moving the crew to Austin. And it made me sick to my stomach. Nothing against Austin or their fans. This is an amazing opportunity. But for Columbus to lose their team, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to continue following this league. It just left such a bad taste in my mouth. But Save the Crew kept fighting. They started a season ticket pledge and quickly gained over 10,000 new pledges which just further proves that Columbus had the support. They just needed the right people in charge. They kept printing out signs, they kept painting murals, they kept releasing videos, and they kept raising money. And then October rolled around, and we were approaching one year since the original Grant Wall tour. Precord had stated his intentions of playing in Austin as early as 2019. They would just have to find a temporary stadium until then. Columbus fans, kind of in the dark, not knowing what their future really held. Was this the last season? Was 2019, 2020 going to be the last season? October 12th, 2018, Cleveland Browns owner Jimmy Haslam, as well as his wife Dee Haslam and Pete Edwards, the former team doctor of the crew, announced their intention to purchase the Columbus crew. And after that, Everything just kind of happened really fast. In December, a judge denied the request of Precourt and MLS to dismiss the lawsuit by the city of Columbus and the state of Ohio to keep their team in Columbus. And then plans were revealed to revamp Matt Frey Stadium into a community sports park. And then they revealed plans to open up a new stadium downtown. And then on December 28th, the lawsuit 
was officially dismissed. Then on January 1st, 2019, ownership of the Columbus crew officially transferred to the Haslam family and Pete Edwards. The Columbus crew were officially saved. Now, as great as the Haslam family and Pete Edwards are, I guarantee you, this was not just out of the kindness of their hearts. They saw for the past year the amount of dedication and support from the fans and the city. But this was a business opportunity, a very promising one. A fan base who fought tooth and nail to keep their team that won't ever get relegated because there's none of that here. It's a potential gold mine if they play it right. And so far, I'd say they're playing it right. Hiring Tim Bezpachenko from Toronto as team president, fantastic move. Getting Caleb Porter, great hire. And the stadium looks incredible. In 2019, the attendance was up despite the team not playing particularly well. And in 2020, well, the pandemic made it really hard to gauge fan support. But Bez and Porter built a really, really good team. And it all culminated with an MLS Cup in 2020. A 3-0 shellacking of defending MLS Cup champions Seattle Sounders. Fairy tale. Going from possibly losing your team to another city to winning MLS Cup. If it's not for the fans, if it's not for the Save the Crew movement, not only do the crew not have another MLS Cup, they don't even have a team. It is the greatest victory by any MLS team. Saving the Crew was bigger than any single MLS Cup. It was bigger than any single signing. And yes, that does include David Beckham. It was bigger than anything because it was the definitive victory for the fans. I know. I'm missing a lot with this, and I apologize about that. I tried my best to tell this epic story, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.